Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are so happy you joined us today for our third menopause talk uh, for, by Let's Talk Menopause on laughter, leaks, and urinary tract infections, tackling the urological problems of menopause. We are joined today by three outstanding experts. First, briefly, my name is Jessica Levin, and I am the director of Menopause Talks for Let's Talk Menopause. Our host today is Dr. Sharon Malone, who was an OBGYN in Washington, D.C. for 30 years and now is the medical director of Alloy, which is a new company providing menopause advice and treatment to women. And we are thrilled that they have chosen to sponsor Let's Talk Menopause for our menopause series. And we are also grateful to Revel for their partnership in supporting our series as well. Our two panelists are Dr. Sherelle Iglesia and Dr. Jocelyn Fitzgerald, and both of them are incredible urogynecologists, and you'll understand more about what that means shortly, and they're also advanced pelvic surgeons. And we know you will learn from them and enjoy them as much as we have during our pre-webinar conversations. So before I turn it over to Dr. Malone, just a few housekeeping items. First, we have disabled the chat so please ask your question and answers in the question and answer section. We will try to answer as many of them as we can, both throughout the webinar and at the end. We also ask you to complete a two question survey at the end of the, of the menopause talk, because we wanna make sure our content is as responsive to your needs as possible. So thank you so much for joining us today. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sharon Malone. Dr. Malone, thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica, for that lovely introduction. And I want to say good afternoon and welcome to all of our viewers today for our third menopause talks. Uh, let's talk menopause. I am Dr. Malone, the medical director of Alloy Health, uh, and I am joined today by my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Cheryl Iglesia of Washington, D.C., and Dr. Jocelyn Fitzgerald of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, Dr. Iglesia and I have known each other for many, many, many years. We won't say how many, um, but we have shared patients and laughs over, over the years. And Dr. Fitzgerald um, actually trained with Dr. Iglesia here in DC. So there's only <laughs> one degree of separation between all of us. And both are very accomplished urogynecologists and pelvic floor uh, surgeons. So the first question that I have is for Dr. Fitzgerald. And there are many people out there that have no idea what a urogynecologist is. Could you just explain to them what is a urogynecologist and how is that different from a urologist? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Malone, also for having me and for Dr. Iglesia for training me um, to become a urogynecologist. So yeah, what is that? And how are we different from urologists? And also how are we different from gynecologists? I think probably the easiest way to understand what we do is we are the Venn diagram between those two fields where we are kind of anchored by the vagina and the way the vagina supports the surrounding structures of the pelvic floor. So urogynecologists are basically anything in the pelvic floor in um, females or women from the kidney down. We don't touch the kidneys, but if it's below there, we probably have something to do with it. So we treat incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, which is when the vagina bulges out, down and out. Um, fecal incontinence, pelvic pain, fistula, birth trauma, um, those sorts of afflictions that are very common, but not normal, which I'm sure we'll get into. Correct. And, and Dr. Iglesia, um, since most patients are probably not even aware, weren't aware of the fact that urogynecologists exist, how would a patient normally get to see you? Well, um, Dr. Malone, it's so nice to be here. <laughs> you know, they come through people like you. <laughs> yeah. you know, we get a lot of our referrals from other obstetricians and gynecologists because as Dr. Fitzgerald was saying, you know, so a lot of the things that we see happen after childbirth. I always say we're end stage obstetrics, you know, but again, um, so some of these conditions that can happen to the pelvic floor muscles and connective tissue and nerves that can lead to loss of bladder and bowel control and droppage of organs. 
um, are referred a lot by um, OBGYNs, but I must also say, I think we actually get more of our referrals from primary care physicians because they've tried all the conservative things. So, you know, they tried medications, maybe they tried, um, you know, talking to you about maybe even a referral to a physical therapist and things aren't, are still not resolving. So primary care, and then not all urologists, mostly those who have done the extra three years, two for urologists and, and fellowship training do not necessarily feel comfortable with female anatomy. So we get uh, not an unsubstantial amount also from urologists who are saying, you know, yeah, this is really beyond the scope of how I feel comfortable. And they recognize that there's this, you know, fourth boarded subspecialty and the second one in, in OBGYN, the second one in urology. And they're like, you know, go to someone who sees it a lot. I'm sharing, you know, I'm grateful for all the referrals, but who also does it on a regular basis, right. particularly when it has, when it comes time to actually think about surgery. You know, and that's, that's a very important point because there is usually the entry point for all of this is really, you know, either through your gynecologist or through your primary care doctor. And there are certain things that we know how to do. And as a, and, and we probably should do those things before patients come to you directly. Um, but there is that area of overlap. And, and one of which is, is what is called now the genital urinary syndrome of menopause. And that is a syndrome that encompasses urinary frequency, urgency, pain, uh, painful urination, pain with sex, all of that, that, you know, that affects the genital area. But we, even though we associate that with menopause, um, Dr. Fitzgerald, can you tell us what are some other conditions that can produce those same symptoms, but may not be related to menopause? Right. I'm glad you brought that up. All of the um, conditions you just described, and I'll add one more recurrent urinary tract infections and, um, vaginitis, vaginal irritation fall under the umbrella of what in women after menopause has been called genital urinary syndrome of menopause syndromes have multiple symptoms contained within them that are related to sort of the same underlying pathophysiology, which in this case is changes in bioavailable estrogen. After menopause, the reason for that is pretty obvious, but even in premenopausal women, there are changes in bioavailable estrogen that can lead to a lot of these urinary problems and these vaginal urinary crossover issues. They include breastfeeding women who are on um, suppressive hormonal treatments, like for both contraception, like oral contraceptive pills, or um, some GN GNRH agonists for um, endometriosis. Some women on Depo-Provera will have pretty profound um, bioavailable estrogen changes where they will get recurrent UTIs, urinary urgency, discharge, recurrent vaginitis, that kind of thing. Um, and then sometimes it can happen with premature ovarian failure mm -hmm. and other like idiopathic conditions where I will encounter a patient who's premenopausal and has no signs of hyperestrogenism, but they will have recurrent urinary tract infections and urinary urgency, and they'll respond very well to estrogen supplementation, particularly topically. Right. And, and these symptoms are sort of the final common pathway for many conditions that actually cause low estrogen states. And right. I think that's one of the things that the take home messages is that we want to give women is that low estrogen, be it through menopause or chemotherapy or breastfeeding all of them lead to this constellation of symptoms because we don't think of it. We think of menopause and we think of hot flashes, but the vagina, the urinary tract, all of these tissues are estrogen sensitive. And when it's not there, it causes problems. So um, thank you for that. Um, and I want to get to our first topic that we were going to talk about today, which is urinary incontinence. And Dr. Iglesia, can you please tell us like what did, how do, would you define urinary continent, incontinence and then tell us some of the different types of urinary incontinence that women might experience? Okay, so let's talk about urinary incontinence and the different subtypes of bladder leakage. So basically it's leaking when you really, and you're, you're passing it when you really don't want to be. <laughs> One of the most common types of leakage and one day I said, I'm going to laugh and then I'm going to start leaking. <laughs> but 
<laughs> is stress incontinence. It doesn't, has nothing to do with you being stressed out, but trust me, there are a lot of people stressed out right now with what's going on in the world. It has to do with the stress, meaning the increasing in intra-abdominal pressure, like when you're coughing or laughing or jumping on a trampoline and you have uh, urine leaking out either in little drops or sometimes big gushes. That's called stress and cons. That's a garden variety. That's the type that most people have like after they deliver a baby. As you get older, the more common type of incontinence is something called urge incontinence. Some people have subdivided that into overactive bladder, wet and dry. So some people have that overactive bladder dry because they go to the bathroom so frequently because they're afraid they're going to wet their pants. And others have the overactive bladder or urge urinary incontinence that does lead to leakage. And sometimes that type of leakage gets more common as you get older, but it also can be associated with even like larger gushes, like embarrassing. Like I have to actually leave this meeting and um, change and, or they bring underwear. Then you can get a combo condition and have both. And unfortunately that's a double whammy uh, because you have both um, the leakage with laugh, cough, and sneeze, and then you also can't make it to get to inside your door, can't, you know, bring your pants down, here I am doing the dance, fast enough to actually sit on the toilet, right? I mean, you know, we've had that, that can happen too. Those kinds of conditions have to be like defined because the treatments for both are very different. I mean, some things are common. I know we're going to talk about treatments, but it's really good to get a good history. And even more importantly, you know, when someone is doing an exam to actually try and listen to some of these things. Right. And, you know, I think that the incontinence is one of those issues that has really come out of the shadows, because if you want to know how common something is, just watch the television commercials and see what's on at night. And it is now for, you know, these 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was never the amount of, um, uh, attention being paid. You know, everybody knows the old gotta go, gotta go commercial right. on, on TV <laughs> and all of the incontinence products that are out there. And, and so the 30 seconds of side effects. <laughs> exactly. But it is important because it tells you the magnitude of this problem, you know, yeah. that, that is really out there. And, and one of the things that, um, I, I I want to ask Dr. Fitzgerald about is that, you know, now that we know that there are different types of incontinence, why is an accurate diagnosis of what type of incontinence, um, why is that important and how does that influence what treatment options you're going to use? Sure. I'm going to use, I have a pelvic model for those watching. Okay. I'm going to pull the bladder out of it. There's, it comes with one. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone can see urgency incontinence, like Dr. Glacia was talking about, where you cannot make it to the toilet in time, you're putting your keys in your door and you're sprinting pulling down your pants that happens because this top part of the bladder is squeezing. It's having, you're having a tremendous spasm and your brain interprets that as urgency. Like I need to get there right now. I'm going to empty stress. Urinary incontinence is as Dr. Glacia pointed out, more related to pelvic floor trauma from deliveries or from chronic cough, obesity, um, that, that kind of thing, raise things that raise your intra-abdominal pressure. And that affects your, the support to your urethra down here where the urine actually leaves. So the reason you need to know the difference between the two or recognize that a patient has both is that the upper part of the bladder that is squeezing inappropriately is treated with medications, Botox injections, and sometimes actually a bladder pacemaker, which is called sacral nerve modulation. And the treatments for the urethra and actually holding the urine in mechanically when you're exercising or coughing is done with something also mechanical. So usually pelvic floor PT to like strengthen the muscles to actually hold better support under the urethra or a, I call them fit like pee hole fillers <laughs> for lack of a better term. And I'm telling my patients, I'm like, you can get Botox to the top of your bladder and fillers to the bottom. Um, which is called bulking or something called a major urethral sling, which is um, the most definitive surgery. And it's an implant with a lightweight mesh sling that's placed through the vagina to actually act as a backstop for the urine. So if you had urge incontinence, for example, 
Actually, I'm going to back up because there's actually some research to show that slings can help urge incontinence. Let's say what you actually have is stress incontinence and then your doctor gives you a Botox injection. It's never going to work. Right. And, and one of the things that's also very important that we don't um, always associate with um, incontinence and particularly stress incontinence, um, you see it, we see it a lot in gynecology for women who have fibroids you know, for women mm -hmm. who have anything that will decrease the capacity of your bladder uh, and women who've been pregnant understand this, that you have a perfectly functioning bladder in urethra and everything's working fine, except there's something pressing on your bladder, be it a baby's head or be it a large fibroid. These are things that can all also, you know, they will be temporary because hopefully you will not have that baby sitting there forever. And fibroids, if that is the problem, then sometimes the solution to that is just removing the fibroids, but it can be quite um, distressing, I think, for women, but it's better when you think that they're, that it is uh, temporary. And I also want you to tell me a little bit more about, you know, prior to surgery, mm -hmm. you know, for incontinence, what are the steps that you would normally have someone do before surgery is typically the last option when you get to Correct. Things. And let's just say you have seen me and I have talked, we've ruled out the other things and we've made, we've gotten you a little estrogen cream to make sure that all works. What is the, what is the sequential uh, evaluation process you would do to then help you decide now what's the next step? What do you guys do when they come to your office? Yeah. Dr. Iglesia. Okay. Well, I think history is um, a really important. In addition to that, um, I think you need to understand um, the woman's lifestyle and her goals. For example, I mean, you talked about pregnancy. We talked about fibroids. Um, you know, if it's a postmenopausal woman who's completed her childbearing, she wants no further children, then, um, and you know she doesn't have fibroids, or let me just say any other pelvic mass, because um, that's very important. I've seen patients who've been treated with overactive bladder meds and no one ever did a pelvic exam and they miss this, you know, stage three ovarian cancer. Unfortunately that mm -hmm. happens. Um, but the history is really important. So you need to kind of hone in when is this happening? Is it just with uh, coughing, laughing, sneezing? Um, is this, what have you tried? Um, and what is bothering you the most? Uh, what are your goals? You know, so if someone has mixed incontinence and they're bothered by, by um, the stress component, they leak when they're coughing, laughing, sneezing, they can't go on their kids, um, um, pred whatever, uh, trampoline, jump and do jumping jacks. You would, and they've tried weight loss because that's one of the first things we know. There's a big pride study out of San Francisco that even with just like a 10% decrease in your body mass index, that can be associated with over a 50% reduction in bladder leakage. And that might be all you need. In addition to the pelvic floor muscle exercises, it's important that you get someone to examine that to make sure you're doing them right. Because I dare say I see patients and half of them, instead of pulling up and lifting, they're doing it they're pushing down. So we have physical therapists who do that. We even have Fitbits for the vagina now that can monitor this. And um, then if we try that, you've done the estrogen and you're not, you're not, we can talk about the fillers. We even have pessaries. So we've got tampons and pessaries and they're special tampons. They were developed out of Israel. You place, I have a patient that just uses that because that's all that happens when she plays golf. And then, you know, if you want another child, I would not probably do the definitive surgery until after that is pregnancy. That's where the fillers are probably better. Right. And then um, if not, we can do outpatient surgery. It's little incisions um, that literally take about 20 minutes and have up to 86% cure rates. But you have to go to someone who's done a lot, who also knows how to handle the complications, who's not going to make it too tight. And it's a Goldilocks thing. Right. And I'll let Jocelyn talk about the urgency component, but that's a yeah. very big panoply of stuff that we have just for the stress in cotton saloon. <laughs> right. um, you know, what's, you know, what's funny and we're, and I am certainly dating myself when I say this, but when I started in residency, urogynecology was relatively new. I mean, before then we had two procedures. Okay. Maybe three, but we, that's all we did. And gynecologists did them. And, you know, and it was, everybody got 
a Marshall Marchetti, you know, or you got what what we used to call an A and P repair, which is basically just you know, uh, what would you call it? A facelift for your vagina? I don't a know. Nip what and would tuck. Be. Yeah. Nip, tuck. Nip and tuck for the vagina. And that was really all we had. And you just hope that whatever patients had, let's just hope it responds to one of those because, well, that's that's what we got, ladies. And I am very encouraged by the fact that, you know, in these, you know, 20 plus years, that now there are so many different procedures. And it is impossible for a gynecologist, a mere gynecologist, to know how to do all these things. It's important that, you know, what Dr. Fitzgerald and Dr. Iglesias do, because that's really what you do. And the the one thing I have always learned. Um, is that the best procedure, if you are going to have surgery, the first one is usually the best one. And that's why being evaluated properly before someone chooses, and also picking a surgeon that knows how to do those procedures is vitally important as to whether or not that, um, um, that procedure is going to work. Because the worst, the last thing in the world is to come back and have multiple procedures fixing the same problem over and over again. Mm -hmm. So um, I have, we're going to break right now because I have some questions and I'm going to um, give you, let's see, I have one. All right. All right. Here's one. Here's a good one. I've had a complete hysterectomy, but have bladder problems. Should I see a uro urologist or a urogynecologist? Softball, everybody. <laughs> I mean, I need a little more information, but my vote is urogynecologist because at least yeah. we can direct you in the right. If you need to go to urologist, we're happy to send you. I, I agree. A fellowship trained female <laughs> urologist. So yes. we have one in our group. I mean, she's a urologist, but Correct. she's not that many, right. but there's some right. urologists who actually get fellowship trained because Johnson and I are both double board certified in OBGYN right. and urogynecology, but urologists can also get board certified in urogynecology. So, you know, make sure they have the extra training and, you know, we can go to the AUGS website, American Urogyne Society website or the SUFU, which is the Society for Urodynamics and Female Urologists. And put be a few places place. where they're just not urogynecologists. Now, you know, for everybody who lives in big cities or you have in a, you know, near an academic institution, then you will be able to find one. But we will um, help you locate someone at least in the in the area. And I think, given how important that surgery is, let's do that. Yeah. Um, and we'll also maybe Dr. Glacia, we can also give that and provide that information um, through Let's Talk Menopause, so people can find out how oh, to, yeah. Happy to how to locate. That link. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're a gynecologist. Okay. Um, oh, here's a question. Will incontinence go away after menopause? If you have it before menopause, chances are you're it's probably not going to get better. The only time that happens, generally speaking, Dr. Glacia can correct me if I'm wrong, is if a patient has stress incontinence and then they get prolapse on top of it. The prolapse sometimes can actually bend the urethra as it pulls the bladder down and out. And people will say, oh, I got this prolapse. Now my incontinence is gone. And that's not actually what happened. It's still there. <laughs> right. And you know what? You know, I used to always give patients. You're well that, trained, Dr. <laughs> you know, but I would you give can. patients that example. You know, it's sort of like um, I, if you imagine this is your bladder and this is your urethra and you get that at the end, it's like kinking a garden hose. It's just you, all you did is pinch it off. You didn't fix yeah. anything, but right. at, you know, subjectively you feel better. But okay. that history is important because, you know, you get the kink and then you want to warn people that, um, you know, once we fix the bulge, you may leak again. And, you know, people don't want to be wearing depends. And so I think we need to forearmed is forewarned and we should probably, you know, address that as well concomitantly, which is why, you know, working with your gynecologist, you know, Sharon, you said that sometimes you would work. And that's what I wanted to say that some people will have a gynecologist work with a urologist and that's okay too, you know, yeah. just get yeah. the right team is making the hit, you know, doing the exactly. right exam and doing the correct procedure, probably preferably the first time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have one more question and then we're going to go to the uh, painful ur urination um, 
section, but there is uh, someone asks, are there issues that menopausal women who have never had children might encounter that are different from those that have had children? So is there a difference with these issues having had vaginal deliveries versus no vaginal deliveries? I mean, I'll let you go, Dr. Glacia, well, but one can get any of them. You know, unfortunately, urinary incontinence can affect anybody. I mean, mm -hmm. I've had nuns with the urinary incontinence. So it, I've had know, nuns with prolapse. I mean, it's nuns, unbelievable. Yeah. So <laughs> not, not, you know, honestly, if you want to look at the epidemiological data on pelvic floor disorders, some people think, oh, I should just have a C-section. In fact, there are some countries like Brazil where mm -hmm. C-section rates are 75%. That's a problem in and of itself. The issue is, is that that mode of delivery, the having the C-section versus mm -hmm. um, vaginal delivery is not fully protective. Being pregnant and just aging is not going to protect you from doing this. So we kind of dissuade that because it's a little bit um, right. a false, a false right. sense of security. Right. And let me put my obstetrician hat on here and say that, you know, having a, a cesarean section just because you're trying to avoid urinary issues is not a great idea. And that's simply because it's major surgery and there are all the other complications that come up with just having had major surgery that, you know, if you're gonna have more than one child are problematic. So have a C-section if you need one, don't have one because you're trying to avoid urinary incontinence because that's why we have uh, Dr. Iglesi and Dr. Fitzgerald here. So, um, all right, we're gonna go to the next step. Um, which is actually painful urination and frequent UTIs, which again, falls under that umbrella of genital urinary syndrome of menopause. So much, so many words to say so many things, but you know, that's what it is. We'll call it GSM from this point forward. But I, I think that again, we start usually with your gynecologist or at your primary care doctor's office. That's a st good starting point. And for women who are having painful urination, frequent urination, the first step is really to say, to find out, is it a urinary tract infection or isn't it a urinary tract infection? And a lot of women have difficulty distinguishing between the two. And if you are in the habit of thinking, oh, I've got a urinary tract infection and you call your doctor and you get a prescription and then you two, two weeks later, you get another one, a month later, you get another one. That is something that's really problematic because we have not really established the fact that there is really a urinary tract infection. And it may be that what you're experiencing are, are the symptoms of GSM. So first things first, if you have more than one and it's not abundantly clear that that's what you have, then the first thing you should do is go to your doctor and get a urine culture just to establish, do I have one or do I not? Because one of the things that women don't understand is that there is a there is a um, a microbiome. There is a there are there are bacteria in your vagina that belong there that protect you from other things, not just urinary tract infections, but also from vaginal infections. And if you repeatedly go with the antibiotics, antibiotics, then you end up making a problem. You take a bad situation and you make it worse. So that's step number one. Step number two, as we talked about before, the uh, topical vaginal estrogen, once we have ruled out a urinary tract infection. All right. So I want to ask Dr. Iglesias. So we have done that. Okay. We have ruled out, we don't know, we don't have a urinary tract infection and we've used some topical estrogen and we're still not exactly where we want to be and patients are still just frustrated by all of these urinary symptoms. Now, I don't know what to do. So now I'm going to send her to you. So now what do you do with someone who is just frequency, urgency, mm -hmm. painful urination? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is where, again, history is important because we're looking at recurrent infections versus another condition that is also painful and associated with urgency and frequency, and that's painful bladder syndrome. Some people call it IC or interstitial cystitis. There's a whole spectrum with the urethral syndrome. Honestly, so you're right. I would check a urinalysis, microscopic, and then a urine culture. But one of the easiest things that I do, because you said you've been on the estrogen, I will check a pH of the vagina. And when you were talking about the vaginal microbiome and there's a urinary a urobiome as well 
They like acid. So the pH of the normal vagina should be at 4.5. When your estrogen levels go low, your pH goes high. Sounds like Michelle Obama, but it's not, not a good version of high. <laughs> You don't want your pH to be in what we call the red zone at 7.5. It might be that you don't have enough estrogen and that we actually need to um, change the dose a little bit. Now, I don't know if you want to talk about the laser thing, because there's like pros and cons of all this laser and the vaginal rejuvenation. We can talk about that later. But you want to make sure. And sometimes when you've been in menopause, because, you know, honestly, ladies, 50% 50% of women by three years post-menopause are probably going to be in the red zone if they're not being repleted. So mm-hmm. the red zone means a high pH. So if the pH is normal and they have the urgency frequency and the pain, what's called dysuria, when they urinate and the estrogen spine and the culture is negative, then maybe my spidey sense will go on to maybe this is not infectious and this is related to something else painful bladder syndrome or any other chronic pain. So it's important. And I know you're a very, you, you're, you're a good historian. Um, you're, she's, Sharon's a good doctor. So she takes good histories and she only refers appropriately. But if it turns out that you're getting in that and there's a whole, there's a whole different workup for painful bladder syndrome. Right. Um, anyway, we, uh, the other, uh, the other tests that we do in addition to the little pH strip, we will occasionally take a look inside the bladder. It's called a cystoscopy with a lighted telescope, just to make sure we're not seeing, you know, sutures in there from your C-section or a little teeny tiny hole or connection with the blat with the bowel. And then we'll check the kidneys just to make sure also that we're not missing something congenitally different with your the way your uh, urine the way your um, urinary tract is set up an extra kidney, an absent kidney, stones or something, although that's not necessarily always the cause. So Mm -hmm. there's a, there's a, there's a little bit of a workup. Actually three urinary tract infections bona fide with positive cultures a year is how we define recurrence. Right. And, and actually in three documented uh, urinary tract infections, not just by history, because that's, you know, like I said, we get that a lot and patients will frequently call in and they will call multiple doctors. So you don't know how many times and they say, Oh yeah, I had it or worse still. And here's another tip that if, uh, if you ever think that you have a urinary tract infection and you want to go in to check, don't take the last bit of your antibiotics from the last time or mm-hmm. borrow a friend's because you've wasted your trip to the doctor's office for your urine culture if you've taken a day or two of antibiotics because nothing's going to grow. So, you know, we want you, you know, we don't want you miserable. We're not going to make you wait if it's Friday, but if at all possible, let's do it without, with the least amount of intervention going on. Okay. Um, and Dr. Fitzgerald, all right, since you're our young person here, I actually want to hear about some of the newer treatments for, um, you know, not only for uh, urinary urgency and frequency, but a lot of people aren't aware of medications that are out there that you would use. So kind of give us an idea of who, you know, if you had this sort of painful spastic bladder, what type of medications would you use? I think in a patient that we've established does not have recurrent UTIs, but does have dysuria, as Dr. Glacey said, or painful bladder syndrome, painful urination. I hate to let you down, but there isn't anything like sparkling and new. It's a very challenging problem to treat, but what is sort of becoming better established is getting to the root cause of why the pain may exist in the first place Mm -hmm. and then building a multidisciplinary multimodal approach to treating that pain. So for young women in particular, although this also applies to women in midlife, if I have a young woman who has persistent urinary pain and bladder pain, I'm asking her a lot of questions about her menses and her cycle and have a very low threshold to refer her for an endometriosis evaluation Mm -hmm. to someone who is trained in the excision of endometriosis, which is a minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon, someone else who also is fellowship trained beyond their general OBGYN training to Mm -hmm. actually excise and remove that endometriosis if they find it. Endometriosis and interstitial cystitis are kind of 
evil cousins of each other and the way that endometriosis can cause hypersensitivity of the pelvic, the nerves of the pelvic floor affect the bladder as well. So mm-hmm. that is probably like the first thing I do in women who are premenopausal. The other thing is anyone can do this primary care, OBGYN, sending someone to pelvic floor physical therapy for some bladder retraining and also an assessment. A lot of times what is actually painful urination turns out to be more painful sort of toileting and pelvic floor spasm. I'm going to pick up my model again, but all of these muscles here that are around the opening um, of where the urethra can go into extraordinary spasm. If a woman is constantly feeling an urge, constantly feeling pain, they clench so much and that can sort of just like feedback on itself. So physical therapy can help with releasing those muscles, trigger points, um, like sort of myofascial release. And then from there, it's a lot of other multidisciplinary medications, sometimes Elevil or amitriptyline. Um, we can do bladder installations for those patients that have sort of a cocktail of steroids and lidocaine and some other like things that make the urine less acidic. Um, we can also do cystoscopies that are more operative. Like if a patient has a lesion in their bladder, that's causing pain, we can inject it with a steroid or we can sort of burn it off actually to make it heal. There's a lot of other things that, that we can do that are coming down the pike, sort of full body treatments that we do with an anesthesiologist or a pain doctor, but those are the big ones. Right. And, and I think that, again, it gets back to what we were saying before, making an accurate diagnosis is really mm-hmm. important because yeah. otherwise you're just trying things and, you know, you right. know, try this, try that. But if you have an approach, I think it'd be helpful. And the one thing that I have found in my practice is that pelvic floor physical therapy is much more helpful than I would have ever imagined because it really wasn't something that we were doing, you know, when I started in practice, but so a lot of those sort of pain syndromes, just as you were saying for pelvic floor pain, for vaginismus, for people who have painful intercourse, um, pelvic floor physical therapy has been quite helpful. Um, Wait, but Sharon, there can is I add one thing sure. for the painful bladder, the two things mm-hmm. that are, we all feel like there's an upregulation of the nerves that these sensory, uh, C fibers, um, and they're being upregulated. So some of the newer technologies deal with neuromodulation and mm-hmm. photobiomodulation. So neuromodulation are like, kind of like, Oh, like, overriding those painful nerves and including, um, the use of a b- bladder Botox for a painful bladder. Yeah. So there's some yeah. new studies on that. The other thing that's super brand new is something called photobiomodulation, which, which has been used a lot in orthopedics. Um, but it's looking at near infrared lasers to look, work at the cellular level at the mm-hmm. mitochondria and at all of these free radicals and the release of nitric mm-hmm. oxide to sort of break mm-hmm. that cycle. Mm-hmm. not only in the organ itself, but in the surrounding nerves and muscles. And I think we're going to probably see a little bit more there because there's, there's a bad sag. I mean, there's a couple of medications, some of which have not been used now anymore that are supposed to be for lining the, the bladder, um, pentosan polysulfate, but was led to different eye issues. Mm-hmm. There's even a lot of overactive bladder meds that don't long-term have, um, really good. Um, they have a bad effect on the brain and cognitive function. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, we sort of have to, we're looking at, at a, at a different level now, rather than just mm-hmm. try, trying to fix a lining or, or right. paralyze a muscle. Right. And, and one of the things that, um, I want to, uh, make mention of too, is the fact that there really are, even though I said, you know, more often than not, what women think are urinary tract infections are more signs of, of GSM. There are women who have recurrent urinary tract infections. And I've seen those who actually will come in and time after time, you know, we'll do cultures and we can document, you know, it's E. coli, it's something. And, and, For those women, and particularly they find that the trigger for those urinary tract infections is usual sexual sexual intercourse. They'll have sex, and the next thing you know, they will have um, a urinary tract infection. Now, I'm going to see if you guys uh, agree with what we do in that in using when you have three or more documented urinary tract infections, and you have tried to treat with topical estrogens to correct 
um, the pH and the, uh, and, and the microbiome in the vagina. Do you use prophylactic antibiotics where you just say one antibiotic at bedtime when on nights when you know you're going to have sex? Yes or no? Where are we on that? Go ahead. If, if it's a patient who legitimately can link her UTIs to intercourse, yes. But that's not a story I get very often from postmenopausal women. That tends to be more of like a younger woman's story. Like every time I have sex, I get a UTI. And then I'll give them what's called postcoital um, macrobiotic, like postcoital prophylaxis. Mm-hmm. I am much more likely these days, and there's some really good data coming out on this. Um, there was even an abstract at Triglycy I heard about at Sufu with like triple therapy, like non antibiotic therapy. They'll give them methenamine hip rate or, and, or D manos, like all of that together with estrogen. And those are not antibiotics have been shown to be extremely effective. So I'll try non-antibiotic things first before I give, before I suppress anybody. That's- right. You're going into the probiotics. I have a funny story yeah. though, because again, it depends on the history. My funniest story about using antibiotics after sex was a I love this story. local <laughs> undergrad <laughs> And I, I, you know, and she says, Dr. Gates, I'm getting them after sex. And I said, well, are you using condoms? Because we know that, that, you know, condoms, rubbers, along with the spermicide that's on it is, um, you know, associated, but I'd rather you, you know, get a UTI than get, you know, herpes or HIV or some other sexual transmitted infection. So I said, just take this after sex. So I gave her a supply and then like three weeks later, she comes in with this rip roaring yeast infection. She said, and she said, well, Dr. Glaze, you told me to take this antibiotic sex. Well, I said, well, how many did you take? And she said, well, seven. It was the whole week. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? One yeah. antibiotic. I forgot that some people can do this more than once a night. So, yes, one <laughs> antibiotic will last you the full 24 <laughs> hours. Just more people about that. Yes, yes. It's you a know, true you're, story. You are it's a true story. I was there for that. I'm happy <laughs> right. that she is using the condoms, but. All right. So I have a couple of questions. And so let's go to this. Um, all right. Here's one uh, person says, I've had honeymoon cystitis since mm-hmm. day one of mm-hmm. her sex life. And she says that, let me see, let me go back here. Um, recurrent urinary in, uh, infections through her first 20 years, she developed vaginismus just that's for those of you, it's like painful spasms, um, uh, contractions of the vagina. And now that she's older, realized that she has nothing to account for it, that maybe the vaginismus was in response to the infections. Um, she has not had sex, um, in many years, her husband died in 2020 Mm -hmm. and she would like to know what can she do now, so we've had UTIs as an early, you know, as a young person, de- secondary, secondarily developed these vaginal spasms and unable to have sex 20 years later. And now she would like to be in another relationship again and wants to know what she can do. Okay, I'll take this one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is pr- actually e- pretty, this is, not easy, this is but great. This is whoever easy. it is. I'm happy for you. <laughs> yeah, you me too. Gotta get, you got to get everything back in working order. Yeah. Exactly. That is exactly right. Because um, this is something that we do a lot of, you know, I would see a lot of women who hadn't had sex in years, they're menopausal. And now it's so painful that they couldn't get any, you know, they just don't think they could get anything in there. And this is a, this is a great example for where you could use, if you make sure that, um, estrogen levels are replete. So either, you know, hormone replacement, if uh, appropriate, certainly topical uh, estrogen to start uh, rejuvenating the vagina. And then we start with pelvic floor physical therapy and dilators. I mean, that's just simple. You start, they're graduated dilator sets that you can use that start teeny tiny, like as small as your finger. And it's just a graduated process. And it really is vaginal physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, and, you know, and I have very rarely had anyone get to a point where they say, I'm just sorry, I, this can never be used again. I mean, the vagina is an incredibly elastic organ. And Mm -hmm. once you sort of restore it, you know, with the uh, right amount of topical estrogen there, it has enormous elasticity and plasticity, you know, it usually can get to a point where women are able to, um, 
to be comfortable, but it also requires that women are comfortable, you know, using dilators. And that's why sometimes a physical therapist is helpful. But, you know, once you've had trauma, the trauma creates its own, you know, it, it, its own weather system. Yeah. And once it's there, whether there is a physical uh, reason for why someone cannot have sex in your mind, the, all of those pelvic floor muscles that we just talked about, they all just clamp down and it's sort of, so it's a behavioral process and it's also a physical therapy process, but yes, I don't think there's any reason why someone wouldn't expect that with the proper treatment that they would be able to resume sexual intercourse. Okay. I agree. Um, totally. Okay. All right. All right. Let me see. Oh, here's one, uh, very common, um, to either of you. Um, I'm not experiencing leakage, but I developed a cough supposedly due to GERD. Can prolonged coughing cause urgency and frequent UTI? All right. Take it, Joss. I would say not really. Um, chronic cough can cause stress incontinence. And sometimes women with a weak urethra from chronic cough or trauma or whatever, can then develop urgency because of the urethral weakness. We kind of understand now a little more that those things are connected. Like if your urethra is weak, when you stand up, like the urine kind of falls lower than it would if it was well supported, which can trigger your bladder to think it's time to go. Like your brain can then trigger urgency. That would be the only way I think that could probably happen, but it would happen via the urethral routes from the chronic cough first. But I must say, I think that person, um, if you're coughing a lot and sometimes these, these meds are causing really bad cough. I mean, medications and GERD itself can cause a lot of cough, but, um, sleep apnea too. You Mm -hmm. must have your gynecologist, urologist, or your gynecologist examine you upright. What I'm finding is that people will examine people in the you know, when they're in the stirrups, in the supine lying down position, they put the speculum in and everything looks, oh, it's good. I can't, everything looks great. Looks great. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, but I'm feeling pressure down there. And, you you know, they've ruled out the fibroid and no ovarian masses. And it turns out if you stand up, then things fall down. So I think that's important to get that in addition to checking the strength of your and making sure you're doing the muscle contractions correctly, that Mm -hmm. if you have a pressure issue, you know, stand up and, and check it kind of like a little squat. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. I have another question and this would be for you, Dr. Fitzgerald. And I think you mentioned this earlier, so you might want to expand on a little bit. Someone sure. was asking about D manos and they say fact or fi- fiction. No, it's a fact. I thought it was a fiction for a while until um, a really great systematic review came out on it. And now there's a lot more good research on D manos. It actually is an evidence-based way to prevent UTIs and you can buy it over the counter. It was a, um, for any OBGYNs listening, it was part of the mock, the maintenance of certification articles for this year was the systematic review on DMATOS and it does, it does work at least in studies. And the Lee's author was one of our former residents who was also a former fellow from Jocelyn's program. So yeah, we know that that was done very well. (laughs) Yeah, see, it's a good see, Sherelle, see, Dr. Glaze, this is why you always have to keep young people in your life because oh there's my God. something that you I know you will they, learn. That not just the technical support. <laughs> <laughs> they keep you up to date. That's sure. That's the exactly right. Okay. So I have another question and uh, someone asked what type of incontinence is, in, is helped by menopausal hormone therapy? Mm. Okay. I would say both. Um, if you think about it from the estrogen level, as Dr. Malone was saying, the, the, um, the uh, estrogen receptors are present in the vaginal, in the vaginal epithelium, the vaginal lining, as well as the lining of the urethra and the bladder. So what we know uh, with using local estrogen is that it kind of fluffs up um, the urethra and the bladder. Um, so from that perspective, maybe the urethra will be a slightly little bit tighter because it's not like a straight drain pipe. Okay. And now in terms of urgency, and that goes that will then speak to the other thing that estrogen will do with estrogen. 
Um, your pH gets lowered down to the normal level at 4.5. And honestly, ladies, it only, it could be men out there too. <laughs> it can only, it only takes up to 12 weeks, usually properly dosed um, on, um, you know, things that we know have been cleared and stuff for this indication. 12 right. weeks and you can go from that red zone to the yellow zone if you use it properly. And so by fixing that pH change in the microbiome, you're also changing all of the bad bacteria that lead to some of the urgency frequency burning. And that gets reversed down to the good bacteria. The good bacteria are called lactobacilli. Right. And that's what you want. You want a lot of lactobacilli, not a lot of E. coli. <laughs> right. Um, okay. And Dr. Glacius, someone, and this came up twice, so I want you to do it again. Someone wants you to repeat slowly where you can go to find a urogynecologist. Okay. Mm -hmm. Slowly, um, the American Urogynecologic Society, that's A-U-G-S dot org for a put in your zip code, uh, find a provider. In terms of the urologist, you would go to SUFU, S-U-F-U dot org, which stands for the Society for Urodynamics and Female Urologists. Okay. And if you want a pelvic floor trained physical therapist, because not all physical therapists actually do work, you know, in the vagina and surrounding regions, <laughs> you would go to the APTA, that's the American Physical Therapy Association.org forward slash women's section, women's health, women's health. And, okay. you know, specifically look for someone who has uh, pelvic floor training. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Here's all right, here's a tough one. Someone asked, can you cure incontinence if there's nerve damage? And I presume as a result of childbirth, but I know, mm -hmm. I'm guessing there. It, it can be challenging for sure. If people have like permanent, like I've seen some patients who have just like an enormous baby and had like a terrible tear and it does take so much rehab to get their function back. Um, but I mean, yes, it depends what kind of incontinence they have. I mean, if they have severe incontinence and it's due to some nerve trauma, it may respond very well to maybe it's the third line treatments, you know, maybe it's surgery, maybe it's Botox or sacral nerve modulation, but um, there's no reason to think that that patient couldn't significantly improve. Okay. You know, I think if you have the severe incontinence and you have a very, very damaged urethral sphincter, we call that intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, the fillers and the, the mini slings and the little meshings may not work. And you do need to see someone who can do uh, what's called an autologous sling using your own tissue. It's a bigger surgery. We harvest it. It's mm -hmm. made to be a lot tighter, um, but you're not going to reject your own tissue. So I think that's important. Um, and, but if it's a neurological condition, say, you know, you have um, myosinia gravis, multiple sclerosis, again, see a specialist because we have um, um, new pacemakers that mm -hmm. are now MRI compatible, specifically designed for this neurogenic population. And they can last 10 to 15 years. Um, and I think that that horizon has changed. We also have new acupuncture and new implantables, even at the ankle. So we're, we're actually kind of getting into the, you know, the cause of the root cause of uh, a lot of the conditions that we see now. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to do a couple more questions um, mm -hmm. because we're, the hour is drawing oh, no, to so a quick. close. It went so quickly. Um, someone asked, these are some quick ones. Uh, is someone at greater risk of incontinence if she's overweight? Yes. 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 Um, uh, someone else, else asked, can C-sections cause bladder issues? Mm -hmm. Yes. Also, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's sometimes you don't think about it, but you know, there can be some, a little bit of bladder trauma at the time of C-section. So sometimes gets back to what I was saying, don't try to have a C-section because you're trying to avoid bladder. That's issues. right. You, you have, have to cut have, down yeah. between the bladder and the uterus exactly. to get the baby out. And exactly. Some of the nerves can get kind of irritated. Okay. And then there is, uh, there are a couple of questions about topical estrogen. Um, how much should women be using? And, you know, it depends on the preparation. If you're using estrogen cream, I tend to use estrogen cream because of the, uh, and there are creams, there are tablets, there are rings, there are lots of different preparations you can use. 
Um, the estrogen cream sort of gives you the most flexibility in terms of how you dose it. So if sometimes, you know, there's a standard dose that your doctor would give you at the time that you get the prescription, but sometimes some women need a little more, sometimes need a little less. You can use it externally as well as using it internally. So in terms of flexibility, that's usually my preference, but you know, again, every person is going to be a little different, but you don't have to use a lot of estrogen, which gets us to the next point, someone asked about the cancer risks of using estrogen. And I can say almost uh, without exception, the amount of estrogen that is in a topical vaginal estrogen is so low that the risk that are associated with uh, that people claim that are associated with menopausal hormone systemic estrogens are almost non-existent with topical estrogens. And that is, you know, so the amount is very low. I think that, it, you know, a cancer risk should be the least of the issues as to why you would not choose to use um, a topical estrogen. And we have a reference for that. I mean, there's yeah. been seven year I follow up on 45,000 women from the Women's Health Initiative on local estrogen alone followed for seven years that showed no increased risk of breast, uterine, ovarian cancer, exactly. or even heart disease. And so the estrogen given topic is very different, but some people do right. have reactions. So we even have an oral that's just designed for vaginal atrophy, but you mm -hmm. know, it's a good, it's right. a good to talk to specialists about that as well. Right. Yeah. And so to do that. You can I go didn't. to myalloy.com. A lot of that information that is out there about the, sort of the misinformation and myths associated with estrogen, um, that's what we do at Alloy Women's Health. So go to myalloy.com and all of that discussion about menopausal hormone therapy will be there. So I just want to thank all three of you, Dr. Malone, Dr. Fitzgerald, and Dr. Iglesia. When I told you all at the beginning that these, these doctors would not disappoint you. I, I think you see why we were so happy that all of them agreed to take time out of their crazy schedules to talk with us. Um, so I, I really just want to thank the three of you for really, you know, providing us the information we need and humanizing it for us 